This content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained on here constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Draper Gorin Home or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments whatsoever. Cheers. <laughs> That is a mouthful. I gotta run to the. I gotta run to the other room and grab my my wine. Um, Jordan, um, you've got to uh, just show that drink to the people joining us now, real quick, because uh, <laughs> as the as what the is person it again? who inspired the meme token, that oh, pineapple nice. drink is very fitting. <laughs> yeah, you always gotta have some uh, some pineapple juice in your rum or vice versa, Something like that. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but I've got some. Uh, oh, some... nice. Have you always had that, or did you did you, get, did you go out and buy a bunch of pineapples this week? Just for you, Alon. Just for you. <laughs> nice. We're Very waiting. Nice. For He's grabbing his laptop really quick. Um, let's give it a couple more minutes. We'll let people in. Sounds good. Sounds good. Are, 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 hey, you, George, are you? Are you in Switzerland or Finland? Where are you right now? Yeah, actually, I'm in Spain. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Drinking Spanish wine. That's nice. Right. <laughs> How long have you been there for? I just arrived, actually, uh, today. Where in it's, Spain it's, uh, are you? Uh, Alicante. It's in the uh, southern part of Spain. Uh, yep. Yeah. Nice. It's, nice. Yeah, it's, it's very nice here. Yeah. I, uh, I have a kind of like an unofficial holiday. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Yeah, I just got back from a two month Euro trip uh, two days ago. Oh, nice. I, I was in Austria and Croatia. And that, was, that was really wonderful. Almost, almost really yeah. free. Um, yeah. Totally yeah. different from here. <laughs> almost. Give mm us -hmm. just a second. I know Scott is logged in through his phone. But he's joining from the laptop to turn on his. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Ooh, already a bunch of questions. I like it. Oh, no. Very cool. How can I make a shit ton of money in the next 24 hours using anything crypto? Upload. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want to know? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. It instantly got the six votes. <laughs> Amazing. Do you think we're going to get someone from the SEC again? Or Satoshi. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We, are, uh, we have I, Irish <laughs> Yam Salmon uh, is in the chat. That's in poor taste. I think should we get started maybe with intros? Yeah. Let's let's yeah. let's jump let's jump in. Adam, what do you want to do? Let's let's start with Jordan. We'll work from from Ed and Stanny, and we'll give our little spiel. And hopefully by then Scott will be on. Perfect. Well, Jordan, take the stage. What's that? Go ahead, take the stage. Introduce All yourself. All right, I'm on the stage. Hey guys, uh, I'm Jordan Mile. Uh, I'm in LA. I work for Consensus. I've been there just over a year or so. Before that, I was with Total. Uh, that's how I got to know Alana, Joseph, and team. Very Total. Woo! Uh, yeah, at, at Consensus, I work at a team called Codify, working on a number of projects uh, within DeFi, a um, number of teams. My team at the end of last year launched the DeFi score, which tries to you know assess risk across different lending protocols. Um, I'm also helping out the team launching the scale token. Um, we're also working on a number of other like data plays within DeFi, doing a lot of interesting things. And it wasn't until the meme token, uh, until Alon got me on here. So I think that might have something to do with it. <laughs> we can could, we could save that for that topic for later if you want. But uh, 
Yeah, happy well, to be we, here. We had you, we had you on the, we did have you on the DeFi Summit. I was on the DeFi Summit. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Meta, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Meta, Parlacar. I'm the CTO of Casper Labs. I fell into the blockchain rabbit hole in 2017 around, oh, you know, the ICO boom and all the zaniness that went with that. And been building the Casper Labs protocol for about two years. And uh, I manage the engineering team and I'm developing the product. And yeah, super excited to be here. I was on the DeFi Summit as well. That was a lot of fun and met Alon and the team at Draper, you know, because they're investors in our protocol. So we're both excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Yes, full, full disclosure. Yes, uh, Casper Labs is a portfolio company of ours. Yeah. And uh, Total's, Total, Jordan's previous company is a portfolio company of ours uh, as well. Stani, what's up, dude? Like, you know, <laughs> back here. Not, Ave is not a portfolio company of ours, but we love what they do. So we have Stani on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Stani. I'm the um, founder and CEO uh, of Aave. Aave is a uh, decentralized money market. So you basically deposit uh, stable coins and other assets and, and earn interest. Um, you deposit uh, basically other assets as a collateral, borrow stable coins and farm other kind of uh, crap and non-crap uh, in, in, in DeFi. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and we started two years ago with uh, ETH Lend, uh, short for, uh, for Ethereum lending. And basically that was the, the first lending protocol in Ethereum. And it basically evolved into what we're doing today. We have roughly 1 billion uh, worth of value locked in, in the smart contracts and things have been growing quite a lot for, for us and in the whole space. And we're living very uh, interesting and, and also kind of like a dangerous times in DeFi. So very excited and, and scared at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it, it is it is a, a insane time. So uh, well, looks like both Joseph and Adam ditched me, uh, but that's okay because the cool people are on screen. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it has been a wild time. <laughs> oh, Joseph's back, good. Um, I heard so, you. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we're, before, before we jump in, actually, we should introduce ourselves. Uh, Joseph and I are, are the founders of Draper Gorin Home. We invest in early stage blockchain companies. As mentioned earlier, um, we're investors in total, we're investors in Casper Labs. Um, and and a bunch of others uh, in the space. Um, uh, Adam uh, wanted me to mention this uh, recording will be available on Blockchain Radio and on our YouTube channel. So uh, make sure to to check it out in both of those places. Um, but yeah, so as Draper Gorn Home, we like to be early stage investors. We try to be the first investor in, in companies in the space. Um, so we're excited to learn alongside the rest of the community in these sessions when we have uh, these super smart people uh, join, you know, join in. Uh, it's it's sort of the, the luxury of, of being an investor. You get to uh, meet people way smarter than you and back them. So um, let's before we got to start with with the crazy stuff that happened this week with with uh, DeFi and all that stuff. And Jordan, do you want to recap the story a little bit of the meme token and all that? I know that's not like your day-to-day -day job of what you do, but your your Twitter joke got super out of hand, and now uh, now is its own token. Did you even were you a part of creating that token at all? I was in other the than token inspiring it. I so let, let yeah let's start from the top. So, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, obviously, with what you guys have seen across DeFi just the last few days, right? Last week was uh, Curve launched their token, and it was. DeFi chat or whoever that act, that launched the the contract. Um, some people think it was just so that they can have plausible deniability that they didn't launch this thing. Uh, but somebody other than the the Curve team launched the Curve DAO contract. You know everything that, exactly how it was supposed to launch. Anyway, so that that's kind of the joke, right? And then the Yam token, and I really like the ideas. I really like the team that built the Yam. Obviously, as we as we know, if you're following the space, there were some issues, some 
some bugs or, or whatever that uh, kind of brought the whole thing down. You can still you can still stake it; it still technically works, but it doesn't function as they intended it. Um, and then you see the the based token, right? Then now now every every emoji or every fruit and vegetable is starting to spin up. And I just thought it was funny, especially you know my my day job is that consensus, and a lot of time. I spend a lot of time thinking about DeFi risk, right? We built the DeFi score. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking, I mean, that's kind of been my my brand in a way uh, the last year or so. I um, travel around talking to people. I've uh, been on panels before, Stanley talking about DeFi risk. And um, it, was, it was a joke. It was only a joke. I posted on Twitter with this mock-up, quick idea that I had. You know, what if there was like a WordPress or DeFi protocols. What if it, in just a couple of clicks, because these are all, they're all borrowing from the same smart contracts, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are using synthetics uh, for, for, the, for the rewards program. A lot of them are using um, Compound for the, you know, the, the, um, the governance, con you know, whatever. So there's, they're kind of just mixing and matching existing smart contracts, you know, bringing them together. Um, at some point, it's just going to be so easy where you can just click, click a couple contracts, execute it, submit it to the, the blockchain, and you're gold. So the idea was, you know, step one, you pick a meme because that always comes first. Step two, you deploy your contract. Step three, you pre-mine. Um, so it was, it was all a joke, and I had a lot, of, a lot of little Easter eggs in there. I was just having fun with it. I thought a few people would laugh. I think I, I thought Anthony Sassano would get a, would get a kick out of it, so I, I, I tweeted it. Uh, didn't expect much, but in just a few minutes, like it just took off virally. A lot of people got a kick out of it. Both the people that are in DeFi and love DeFi and work on DeFi, and then like the Bitcoiners who are who thought they were making fun of DeFi, liked it because yeah. it's kind of self, um, you know, poking fun of themselves a little bit, right? So yeah. it, it was really just an effort of like, uh, you know, like commentary on the space how we're just like throwing things into production testing in yeah. production we're just we're just um you know we're not maybe some of us have good intentions but not but not everybody spends the time to get audits etc so it's really a commentary on that uh but it was just funny how how quickly it took off and i'm thinking well i don't have a sound cloud but maybe yeah. i can capture, <laughs> maybe i can capture some of this momentum so i so i spun up a quick website that I, I titled this thing, I, I branded this thing, the Degenerator, and um, I spun up Degenerator.finance in, <laughs> in just a few minutes to spun that up, and I just linked it to a Notion page, and I was just managing that. Uh, like, what am I going to do with all these people that are just, like super motivated and want to do something? I'm like, oh, a Telegram group. Of course, you got to start a Telegram group. It was still, it was still no, no concept of a token yet. It was just like, let's get a bunch of cool people that get the joke let's get them all on a telegram group and see what happens so we spun up a telegram group and literally within minutes within 30 minutes uh it was just completely out of my control at this point right it was well past my joke um the company kind of or the the the, the community kind of rebranded no we're meme now we're we're dollar sign meme and uh oh we need to launch a token so like it started out as a joke and then a lot of people thought it was serious we're really going to build this product and then someone, then someone said, no, we're, we're much more than a product. We're a whole platform, right? And we're going to call ourselves meme. And there was, a, there was an airdrop. It actually, in just like this bizarre way, it started into like this pump and dump territory, right? Where people wanted to buy this token. And then some people put it on Uniswap. Some people just dumped it as soon as they could. But there were a number of people that just held on to it uh, because they, they bought into this vision. Uh, of like a meme token, of like a, a DeFi Doge, um, Doge of Tomorrow. Uh, so it was just silly. I had in the in the mockup, I I happened to brand it or have to have one little image in the mockup as a pineapple. So that took off as the brand. Um, and the whole the whole meme of the whole thing, it's it's actually trading now. Just within a couple hours, it was listed on on CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap. Uh, the community is up to like. 3,200 people or something. Uh, wow. at, its peak, <laughs> at its peak, it hit 1.2 million in market cap. Right now, it's hovering around 900,000 in market cap. It's, it was one of the, <laughs> more, one of the most fun, if, if not the most fun projects I've ever been on, the most, most fun 24 hours I've had in DeFi. 
Yeah, yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's a balance, right? Because I spend my day job saying, "Don't, don't do this stuff. Don't take the." Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, I. But we're having a lot of fun. The 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 whales that dumped are out of there. Some actually, some big names in DeFi uh, were were holders, and then they then they dropped their bag. But uh, there's. Um, Anyways, it's lots of interesting and lots of interesting lessons to be learned about memeing and communities and just getting the community engaged. And it's well, been a lot of fun. I, it's not my project. The CEO is Elab Monk, and he's he's just uh, he's, he's he, he actually named himself like the CEO. Like if there's an actual CEO. Yeah, Elab Monk is the CEO, and the meme is don't buy meme. That's that's don't find me. Don't find me. I, what's funny is that that night it, it reminds me of the yam. So the night of yeah. yam, I was waiting up till midnight because I wanted to watch that vote thing happen or not the vote, but like everybody was delegating their tokens so that one specific person could have the power to like edit the bug or whatever and fix it. And so when I went to bed soon after midnight, I was like, holy crap, hundreds of thousands of people or thousands of people at least got together with no way of communicating like all through Twitter or random stuff and they voted and they got it to work. And I was like so stoked like at the end of the night, like wow, like all these people got together, the crypto community came together, how rad is that? And I went to bed and by the time I woke up and I wake up really early because like my kids wake me up at like six in the morning, I look at my phone and the token had just gone down like 90 something percent in value. And I went online, they're like, yeah, it turns out we couldn't fix the bug. <laughs> like, and, and so it was kind of similar with your thing. That night I shared it because I thought it was hilarious. And somebody kept going like, oh my God, is this a real thing? And I was like, no, it's clearly a joke. You know, all these Bitcoiners were like, can you believe how crazy DeFi is getting? I'm like, no, it's clearly a joke, guys. Stop it. And then by the next morning, I wake up and there's like, there's a meme token now, and there's a pineapple, and Jordan is the king of meme. You know, I was like, what is going on here? I'm just the uh, humble so, servant. No, I'm, I'm it's crazy. Servant. So uh, <laughs> before we dive into the rest, um, Scott, you've joined us. Scott, give us hey. uh, the intro about yourself. Thanks for joining. Yeah, uh, quick bio. Um, I thought I could join on mobile web. I couldn't. So I had to go to the office. Um, we also created a site called DeFi Pulse with the team. Um, and that's been really fun. Um, and lately I've been really interested in taking GAM emojis and putting on people's heads. Um, and then publishing that on my Twitter account. And that's been most of my time the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Sound Sounds sounds about right. So you guys do DeFi Pulse? Uh, yes. Uh, we, we have a few sites uh, like F Gas Station um, and uh, Dex.ag. Uh, but yeah, we just kind of nice. do fun stuff. So I've been, because of uh, all this craziness, I've been on ETH Gas Station about 18,000 times a day for the last two weeks. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... It's it's been there's been some uh, technical difficulties with like the crazy rushes and dependencies breaking and it's been a bit of a headache but we think it's like it's been it's been stable for a while now for a week or so which is a long time. Well, I... yeah, I mean the the e, the gas in in Ethereum has just been absolutely wild the last last few weeks. So so that's actually a good yeah. uh, a good uh, probably segue to. To, to go to Meta and <laughs> talk about, yeah. so, so, you know, there's all this talk about ETH2 um, coming and who knows, you know, um, <laughs> sorry, I looked over at the chat and somebody said, do, do pineapples give you gas? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, they do, apparently. Um, uh, or they, they, I don't know where I was going to go with that. Let's not go there. Um, so, so there's ETH2 coming, there's Casper, um, and there's all these other protocols, but but Casper, I feel like, is a little more um, on par with the Ethereum community, or there's a lot of uh, back and forth there. And I would love to hear sort of, you know, where you think this this is going, right? Like, um, because obviously Casper is uh, could be a possible solution to this. ETH2 is a solution or can be, but we don't know when it's coming, how it's coming. Um, specifically more specifically so i'd love to hear your high level you know thoughts 
thoughts on all of this stuff and oh uh, yeah yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah I got strong opinions i got strong opinions about what i think needs to happen uh you know for like DeFi is a great end user use case for blockchain it's a it's a perfect one it's kind of if we look fast forward in the future we kind of see this wonderful future of decentralized finance and disintermediation right that's what blockchain is really great at and if you can build a secure performant blockchain to to solve those problems it opens up this world right and all of us that are kind of neck deep in blockchain we see that we see that future but like if you look at where we're at today there's a lot of challenges in uh, even building applications on blockchain technology particularly public decentralized blockchain technology for a variety of reasons right um and uh you know my background is really in traditional professional large scale enterprise software companies i've been working in those for 20 years as a as a technology leader and so when i looked at what it took to build contracts and maintain contracts and manage contracts on the blockchain i was like what <laughs> what is this <laughs> you know and it became really obvious really apparent really really, really early on that that uh, all all software is governed like i firmly believe that it's centrally governed but all software is governed, right? And even today um, in professional engineering shops, your software is governed, your, how you release your software is governed, how you upgrade it, what goes into your upgrades, that's all governed. And in a decentralized world, that is really, really important, right? You need to be able to govern your software as well. And we're not, we're not even talking about central governance, it's even more critical because it's decentralized governance, right? So, as you said, it's a wonderful thing that everybody in the YAM protocol got together and were able to vote on this bug, but then in the end, they weren't able to fix the bug. And you have to ask yourself, how much confidence do they have in their ability to actually fix the bug to begin with? So what we're building, right, so we see the blockchain, uh, my perspective is the blockchain, uh, broad adoption needs a couple of things, right? One, it needs a fantastic UX for the end user, and that's really gonna be wallets, account recovery, making it really, really easy to interact with blockchain technology. The second thing it needs is really strong software governance. So contract authors need to be able to do, be able to manage their on-chain code, right? And then the third thing it needs is scalability without sacrificing security. And so that's what we've set out to build, right? We've set out to really try to solve all three of those problems. Um, uh, it's non-trivial, it's a pretty big challenge, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about what we've got planned. Big elevator pitch there, but like that's my perspective yeah. on where I see this technology needing to go. Yeah, I mean, there clearly we're seeing um, in the Ethereum world right now. We've seen it in the past, like it was sort of a, a joke back in the day when you know Crypto Kitties, you know, uh, flooded the network and and all that. But now there are, you know, there's a cross between memes <laughs> and and real use cases with literally hundreds of millions of dollars being staked on different projects, different things like that. And I think the fees um, for me, you know, I, I wasn't even thinking about it at the time when it first got crazy sort of last week when everything started going, going really nuts on the gas fees and things like that. I didn't really think about it too crazy because I was like, look, hey, this is, you know, magical internet money. And if it costs me five bucks for a transaction or 10 bucks for a transaction instead of 50 cents, like who cares? This is like, this is craziness and I'm learning and it's, you know, it's not really ready for mainstream anyway. Uh, but then I went on um, Rarible and I tried to create a collection of NFTs and it was like 200 bucks or something like that in mm -hmm. estimated gas fees to do it. And I could have just created the NFT without a collection. And it would have cost me like 20 bucks or something. But what it made me think about is like being a kid and trading baseball cards and or trading comic books. And imagine like if I wanted to go to Jordan and be like, here's this basketball card. And he'd be like, here's this comic book. But before we can trade it, I've got to we each have to put in a dollar. We never would have traded it like, you know, it's so like all of a sudden I realized like, oh, shit, you know, like for actual mainstream adoption, it can't happen this way. Um, right. And in the finance space, I feel like eh, it's it's like a trade off, like, OK, we're all making hopefully if these things are built right, like Ave, you know, you you earn a higher percentage of yields because we cut out all the fat and we cut out the middlemen and we basically, you know, the banks aren't taking advantage of us. So if we have to pay an extra buck in a fee, like that's how I felt about it. But 
as you go closer to mainstream, so super long roundabout way of going to um, going to the thought of, you know, do you think, uh, you know, do you guys obviously keep this in mind, but do you think there is a, uh, uh, a, a sort of exodus coming? Do you think that guys like Stani will move Ave off of, off of Ethereum to other chains if, uh, if the incentives are there? I'm certainly, I mean, we are definitely banking on it. We think that there's, um, if you build a, a pro, I don't believe in if they build it, they will come, right? You need very strong incentives um, that, that your customers, you got to build a great product and then you have to incentivize your customers, potential customers to move over to what it is you're building. But I think, some things are like really table stakes, right? Like being able to test your smart contracts using a computer, right? Eventually, I believe all blockchain based code or on chain code is going to have some kind of an interface. So are you telling me because my contract is immutable, I can't safely ever change the user interface that interacts with it? Like, what's the risk if suddenly I change my iPhone app or Apple changes something in my mobile app and now it's like, parsing my account hashes or my account strings completely differently and it's sending some of the smart contract that just doesn't work and my smart, con smart contract bl blows up right so how do you unit test your smart on-chain code right so we've actually built something in our ecosystem where you can unit test your smart contracts i from my perspective it's massively important it's also really important to have a decentralized governance process to say these are the people that can upgrade this contract and it's all on chain so it's not like the governance processes for who's upgraded the smart contract is necessarily an off-chain governance process, which is fine, but it's actually transparent and you can see that these are the public keys that can sign an upgrade for this contract, right? And okay. that's hugely important. Um, right now, a lot of these DeFi protocols have built governance tokens, which I think is fine. I think that's, that's a perfectly reasonable way to do it. But what about the individuals that want to contribute to the project that don't buy governance tokens, right? How do they get tokens? Do you set up a bounty system? I mean, what we've built is a weighted key mechanism that allows you to basically um, earn more weight. Maybe you earn. Oh, you're cutting out. Is, is Meta cutting out for others? Okay. so. I, I think I know know where Meta's going, and I and I and I kind of love this. And I get a couple of the people are saying, you know, mm -hmm. immutability is 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 a feature, not a bug. But if if change logs and things like that are on chain, and maybe governance voting based on certain weights, you know, some some DAOs are doing that, right? Like some people get you know reputation scores that are higher than other folks and stuff like that. So is there a um, is there a way? Uh, of kind of a combination of the two where being where you can you know where you can have the immutability but if there are changes it's sort of voted on by governance it's on chain you know uh stani i would love to hear from you you know how, how you feel of, of sort of the rigidity i i think uh i it would be interesting um to to hear how you guys feel about it and how you feel you know like do you think your users would would move uh, to a different chain if they could get the best parts of Ave, but not uh, but not pay the fees, for example. Do you think that would add to more adoption? Do you think, you know, like how how do you think that would work? Definitely, I think like whole whole idea of of DeFi is is pretty much to kind of like bring more efficiency and and better uh, capital usage and and interoperability uh, into the financial world. And I, I think kind of like the, the, the system that the bank, the traditional banking system is built, it's very expensive, uh, but the costs are borne by the financial institutions that are making these networks possible and, and, and basically safeguarding the networks. And that way they're, they're taking the cost on behalf of the user. Uh, what I see basically is that um, in, in DeFi, uh, pretty much the users are bearing the cost of utilizing the network, but nothing stops uh, different kinds of layer, la layers to actually uh, pay the fees. But uh, as we see now in Ethereum, uh, for example, that uh, uh, because of all the, the traction that there has been with, with the uh, yield farming and, and DeFi in general, uh, the costs are pretty high in gas. And I'm pretty sure that uh, like if you ask 
like if you ask me or you ask anyone in the DeFi space, uh, I think quite many will pay less, let's say instead of $100 uh, dollars worth of gas, you would rather pay something that is uh, $1 or not even that. And I, I think that's something that we always kind of like need to has as a goal that that basically we reduce this kind of like costs because the the another idea is that uh, we're trying to a bit of democratize the, the the finance and and create new opportunities to people that could not access it uh, in in their current banking system and that's pretty cool. For example, like in in Ava we have this so-called uh, interest bearing A tokens and. That's a pretty cool thing because you could just uh, basically deposit, uh, let's say, die. You get in return a die that algorithmically grows in your balance, uh, and that virtually is a uh, USD USD nominated interest bearing accounts, which is permissionless. And the thing is that you could buy uh, a die, and you don't need to deposit, for example, anywhere, any, any part of the world. But the the problem then is that uh, if it costs you more to to buy it than actually to earn. On the interest, uh, is it actually worth it? And and that's that's like very uh, confusing to many people as uh, newcomers are entering into the space and and like they hear so many good things about DeFi and then they're kind of like blocked with the uh, higher gas fees and that becomes like kind of like a bad user experience. And I saw it happen a few years ago uh, as well when we were building smart contracts, which were inefficient and they they were consuming a lot of gas and we had the kind of like the same problem uh in our history and and and, and back in the days so definitely i think like interoperability and, and finding uh, solutions that allow scalability uh, is definitely the next thing like this is something we're looking at oh, very intensively uh, and almost like have reviewed all of the uh, protocols that are available for us there and i i i definitely believe that uh DeFi is like I'm a big Ethereum fan, and and I I, I started in Ethereum. Uh, I I love it. Uh, I I love the community, uh, the developer community, and and also the 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 user based community and all the memes that there are. Like even the craziest uh, meme, meme coins, but kind of like in, in the sense of community building uh, perspective. But I also see that actually like in the future, liquidity should move from one network to another, and and basically depending on what kind of underlying network risk there is and scalability. And I just don't believe in the fact that if you have a financial transaction that you need to broadcast it to the whole network, because I mean, uh, you need enough security to cover uh, basically that transaction, but you might not need like to broadcast it to the whole networks. And, and then this is why uh, solutions like what Casper is building is pretty interesting and a and, and bunch of other uh, stuff that is going on. So definitely I, I think like uh, in terms of liquidity, if the incentives are aligned, we'll see a lot of uh, movement. And the the key trick, of course, is to create incentives that will work. And it's not always uh, as easy as as launching a uh, uh, meme or or Wi-Fi or or because I mean, it, it's just like uh, it's it's not all it, it's not that easy always. Uh, at, at least from what I see. Yeah, well, I got a ton of crap, <laughs> a ton of crap when I. Uh, got very excited when Ren launched, and I moved a small fraction of Bitcoin from, you know, on Ren BTC to to the Ethereum network. And I said this was amazing. My only problem with this was Bitcoin, uh, because Bitcoin took ten times longer than any transactional part of Ethereum did. And I love Bitcoin. It's, you know, I, I will always be a huge fan of Bitcoin, and and I hold Bitcoin, but. I I was so disappointed. I kind of forgot how long it took to wait for six you know six confirmations <laughs> on the Bitcoin blockchain, and I just sat there and I was like, this is gonna take like forty five minutes, you know? Like it was like, can you in this day and age, it's it's wild. So so going towards you know Scott and 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 uh, and and Jordan, um, you know Scott maybe because of DeFi Pulse and and watching all of this stuff. I think you guys monitor how you know how much is moved from you know to into ren btc or wbtc and some stuff like that i think if i remember correctly um uh but the you know do you guys think that because i i imagine a, a future where there's a bridge right where i can have a uh a die on on ave 
and I go, oh crap, you know, Ave created a version on Casper Labs or or on Casper, or you know, there's this other thing on Casper I want to test, and I I envision a world where there's bridges like that from blockchain to blockchain, just like you know on you know when you open up a web browser, there's multiple programming languages that that are at play when you you know go onto Facebook or we're using this. I'm sure if we looked at the code, there's JavaScript, there's CSS, there's HTML, whatever. They all seamlessly work together. I do imagine some interfaces where you can easily bridge from one to the other. Um, so, so, you know, we're talking about mainstream adoption. Yes, yeah, Joseph just was messaging about this on, on our side chat. Um, we're, you know, we're talking about mainstream adoption. Do you think that when you go from things like Ethereum, which we all obviously love and we're all obsessed with and we're all here for that reason, right? Um, and then you go to something like Casper where, where it might be more efficient in certain ways um, or better in other ways or just different, different groups of people, different products, right? Like, do you guys see a bridge creating? Because I feel like Yam and these kind of things kind of showcase how flexible and, and almost, I don't want to use this word, but I'm going to use this word selfish people are. We all knew that Yam was insanely untrustworthy. Like we had to click through a few disclaimers, including from the Yam team, right? Saying this is not tested, this has not been audited, but still hundreds of millions of dollars went through, right? So Scott, Jordan, what do you think? You know, like is uh, there gonna be that that bridge? I mean, I would yes. Uh I do trust the Yam team for what it's worth. And I trust them. I think they did an accurate job of uh, relaying how much time was spent auditing the contracts, which was none. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, the throughput on Ethereum is obviously filling up. Um, and the only way to like satisfy everyone sort of is by like rationing transactions based on gas price. Um, and I think what you're seeing is like, what was like maybe memed as F killers are actually kind of turning into maybe like, uh, something similar to, but different in many ways to like F shards, um, before, uh, there actually are uh, like shared security F shards. And I think you'll see like kind of the Ethereum to um other blockchain bridge kind of being a top priority for projects and uh i think that'll be like a a good like 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 a really cool way to kind of like have scaling um now uh but i also think that sometimes when it feels like when people say there are 64 s shards like that'll be so much more space um but if the like the like when things grow exponentially like 64x actually fills up uh, like pretty fast in time and so um i don't know i i guess I, i'm seeing like there's like so many different possible roadmaps for how like the topology of blockchain space develops and a lot of the parameters that will determine what topology dominates i don't think are even knowable yet but like one that's very plausible to me is kind of where, you know, you, you're already sort of seeing like Bitcoin F bridges through some of the uh, interoperability for only Bitcoin special purposes, but sort of where Ethereum is kind of like maybe the highest security or kind of the settlement layer. Um, but you're seeing like a lot of like uh, a lot of high volume transactions um, on, on platforms that don't share security with Ethereum. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the traditional world, people build all sorts of one security measures, but also scalability stuff, right? Like caching in in web development and and, and in in other types of development. Um, Jordan, being at consensus, consensus, as far as I know, is is purely ETH focused. What are they doing about scalability? Do you think they'll be involved in building bridges? Do you think that MetaMask will one day support more than just Ethereum? What what's what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, if you fork it, you can go support any network, right? Um, no, I there is some there is some uh, you know cross chain projects going on. There's a big one um, uh, that's you know trying to bridge ETH and Bitcoin and, and get get like atomic. Um, swaps in between bitcoin and eth and there's a lot of interesting projects but but you're right 
um, there is a, a very large focus on Ethereum in the network. And it's it's not in the company vision or the mission statement that this is just an Ethereum thing. Um, I, I don't mean to speak for the entire, entire company, but the way I understand it is um, there's still an open mind. And however, we see Ethereum as biggest opportunity for like a web three decentralized world moving forward. So uh, we're never, you know, never say never, but, uh, and we'll keep an open mind. Uh, but right now Ethereum is where it's at. I think at the end of the day, that's what everyone one's here for. And um, I, I for one welcome like these quote unquote Ethereum killers or attempted killers, uh, challengers, uh, anyone that's Anyone that's experimenting with other technologies, other um, memes, whatever, like let's, we should, as an Ethereum community, those of us that are, um, we should welcome challengers and we should welcome uh, um, people trying to do better with the, than us. Competition uh, just helps everybody out. It strengthens the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. If someone has a better idea, let's try it out, even if it's on a different chain. It just happens to be that Ethereum captured so much of the of the mind share. Uh, network effect is huge, um, and it's just it's just hard to stop. Given given the projects that are building this space, the developers, the memes, the community, the uh, the investment. Um, there's just there's just so 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 much. It's unstoppable. I I don't, I don't think there's there's much of a chance for anything else to kind of surplant um, Ethereum right now. For sure. I mean, and you kind of also mentioned you, you welcome that, right? That, that challenge people coming to you with the killer Ethereum app, right? I want to kind of jump to the QA and Pierre asks this, can there be DeFi on other blockchains? And I guess the question is obviously yes, but have you guys like what, what projects come to mind and what blockchains come to mind when you think of DeFi outside of Ethereum? And feel free to jump in, Jordan. You can you can begin. We can take it to Stani. Yeah, I I I I'm a person that goes to uh, DeFi Pulse, and they tell me that uh, uh, the Lightning Network is considered DeFi. So sure, that's the, that's everything else is Ethereum. Uh, I I don't think about any other platform other than than what's on there. Um, that's all I know about DeFi and other chains, which is which is yeah. okay. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, actually, yeah. actually wait, there's quite interesting stuff going on on, on Cosmos. Like there is, there is like, I, I I was involved in one hackathon. Uh, I think it was under a year ago or roughly a year ago, and I've seen a lot of things being built on, on Cosmos, and uh, some of the projects still are uh, being continued and seeing new stuff there. Uh, and also, I've seen actually this is funny. Uh, I've seen stuff happening on Tron as well. I, I'm not sure how legit stuff <laughs> they are given the uh, the nature of the uh, uh, proof of stake, but I, I think like every chain has their own kind of like community and and being built. And I I think it just it's all about like how you attract also developers. And Ethereum has been doing that pretty well. Uh, when we started um, uh, in the in the first days, I tried to figure out like how how we could build a lending mechanism uh basically on top of bitcoin and the the kind of like a challenge was the technicality that uh basically didn't have smart contracts where you could actually create different kinds of uh uh programming and uh, program money in uh, various ways that you need and now we see uh, these days that we have quite a lot of uh chains that actually support smart contracts and and they have uh virtual machines so like the, the, the kind of like the field is open. It's just kind of like where you find uh, the community that, that uh, uh, developer community where uh, you feel uh, nice to build things. So I, I, I'm expecting quite a lot, but uh, for example, Lightning Network, I'm not sure like, I, I know some people use it, but how much? Because like the, the problem of Lightning itself is because it's also like payments, Bitcoin payments and Bitcoin is volatile. So it's kind of like, quite challenging to use it as a payment still. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see like how things are building. Uh, and I, I think uh, Nier is a very interesting project as well. Um, stuff going to happen there as well. Ave will do something there. 
same for Pol Polkadot. I, I, I think there's just so many things. I, I think we internally even need like themes to, to just try to kind of like uh, new uh, spaces because I, I truly believe that the, it's not a game of winner takes all. I just think there will be like different kinds of networks and their own like uh, particular uh, properties that attract liquidity or just usability. Yeah, I mean, if I'm to shill Casper Labs, I'm definitely going to say Casper Labs is going after DeFi use cases, right? We are providing a lot of tools for DeFi protocols to not only, you know, create uh, innovative new DeFi protocols using the extended features of the VM, but then also to be able to govern them on chain transparently, right? So definitely uh, hoping that uh, Casper will gain the adoption. And, we, you know, you're absolutely correct about developer community, but we're focused really heavily on, you know, developer usability, um, basically building the tools that are future proof, right? So if your DeFi protocol goes, if you discover a bug in your DeFi protocol, what can you do to address that bug in interest of your customers, right? And that's really like what we're focusing on is how can you service your customers um, honestly and transparently on chain with, with a high degree of security, right? So definitely, we're definitely hoping to, to be able to become a real player in the DeFi space as well. well I have to say like the, the, the security part is becoming like more and more important every day. And I, I've been actually like uh, wondering like why, why we don't have any, any kind of like more focus on, on the network level. We're kind of like, we have always been focusing kind of like optimistically uh, basically building something that is uh, very Turing complete and, and, but uh, it's also is uh, very error prone and, and just kind of like we could have Turing completeness, but we also could build uh, different kinds of tools in the network level and, and supportive tools to actually avoid uh, that human error. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's something that's, I, I think like increasingly, especially at Aave, it's, it's like heavily increasingly uh, thing that we are kind of trying to uh, look at. Mm -hmm. So do you yep. think that security is actually, that's what's stifling better UX and UI, right? More more yeah. adoption outside of the general crypto community? I, I think it's a question of legitimacy because uh, we just need one big failure uh, in DeFi and it just needs to be one kind of like a, uh, it could be a meme project that just, just attracts uh, half of the liquidity in DeFi and just explodes. And then it basically tarnishes the whole space and it's very difficult to get the reputation back. So, so the, the interesting th thing about DeFi is that it works as the code is executed, but it also like it's very difficult to remove human trust uh, always or trust in brands, trust in what other people says, are saying. So if there will be a failure and we have basically kind of like reputation that we have been building for uh, years now and, and we lose that trust, it, it's really, really difficult to get it back and we can always kind of like argue that uh well we can always verify the contracts but not all the users can actually do that and and also if thinking uh not everyone should do that and i would kind of like want to trust the developer who already checked the code and is reputable of, of doing that and and a few other developers and then kind of like it, it's deemed to be safe enough to use but uh it's, it's kind of like very difficult to uh, think of idea where I would personally have to read code and understand it uh, and, and then kind of like make my uh, decision because that's not capital efficient, uh, even time wise. So, so definitely I, I think like security is becoming more important. And if, if, if kind of like we as a space don't have a consensus that we need to build things securely, test properly and, and, and basically use best practices and, and and even kind of like have some sort of uh, uh, mathematical and formal verifications on what we're building, because these protocols will hold uh, at some point even trillions if we go go that far. Mm -hmm. But we can't go that far if, if there's basically uh, things exploding on, on, on the way. And uh, don't get me wrong, like I really love innovation and experimentation. And that's super, super cool thing. It's just basically there's few steps that could be done to improve security before we launch the experimentation uh, accessible to uh, tens of thousands of users who are piling up the liquidity there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I tend to agree completely. Um, you know, our protocol, we started with math, right? And so 
Um, we have the safety proofs, the liveness proofs, right? And we're grounded in that first and foremost in terms of our process for delivering the, uh, for building the protocol. And we're, you know, the Casper protocol that we're building um, is not probabilistic, right? Um, we actually have all the stake needs to vote on the transactions, right? So every, every validator has to participate fully in the network and, and you know, slashing it 100%. Right. It's a little scary when you talk to your validators and say, no, no, no. If you equivocate, you're slashed at 100 percent. They really don't like to hear that. But that's where the security in the network comes from. And it becomes exceptionally important. Uh, from my perspective, the only thing blockchain gives you is security and trust. If it doesn't give you that, you should just go use a database. Right. It's a it's kind of a strong it's a strong opinion. Um, I think blockchain does a lot of things. But the first thing, the first foremost thing it does is it gives you a trustless environment to execute transactions. And if you do anything to compromise that trust, you've kind of just cut it off at the knees. Um, so you know, for DeFi, particularly locking trillions of dollars of value, you have to have that underlying trust in the protocol. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. And in, in Stani, you kind of touched upon this, and I kind of want to hear from Scott. right? From a UX, UI perspective, right? in, in getting further mass adoption, you're seeing, I guess, new products, for example, like Furo Combo, I hope I'm not but butchering that, which basically allows you to just to stack different lending protocols, different lending solutions right on top of each other, which they kind of gamify, right? And you guys kind of created a really beautiful interface on how to keep track. And Jordan said it himself, like, I rely on DeFi Pulse to understand, okay, what's happening in the DeFi space. So maybe you could tell us what are some of the more interesting UX, UI products, solutions that are being built that helps people better understand the space visually like you've guys done with DeFi Pulse? Um, well, I'm a pretty big uh, Zapper Fi fan. Um, it's essentially like a DeFi protocol, uh, like a DeFi portfolio watcher. Okay. Um, and they do a pretty good job because if you're really in the thick of the space, you have like random assets doing random things all over the place. And it's a little hard to keep track of that, uh, but they do a really nice job of like, making so you don't have to use a spreadsheet, um, which is pretty cool. Um, there's also a very nice uh, MIT licensed open source site called uh, yieldfarming.info. Um, it's uh, built by Weeb McGee. Um, and uh, it kind of like, a, it like basically lets you know, like kind of what the different yield farming opportunities are. Um, sometimes you have to check on the GitHub uh, because they won't actually be linked to on the main page. So you have to see what folders are out there. Um, but it's it's a pretty good tool. Um, and uh, yeah, th those are definitely definitely my my two go tos right now that that we didn't build. Um, cool. But yeah. So okay. So following on to the next question, um, I want to give me give me just a second. Okay. So I guess I can kind of direct this towards everyone. Can you touch on Ethereum wrapped BTC for yield farming and any other type of innovative ways to diversify in the space to increase adoption? It's kind of like a grammatically fragmented uh, question, but I guess it's it's just kind of asking like yield yeah. farming. Yeah, I, I, can, I can answer that. So, um, yeah. so like yield farming, it sounds like it's like an interest rate thing and it started with compounds. So that's like a little extra confusing. Um, but really, if you think about sort of like how do people distribute tokens, kind of Satoshi had like no tokens and then block rewards um, as a way for people to initially get Bitcoin. Um, and then Ethereum sort of like had a pre-sale, um, which is pretty successful. And basically you pay money and get things. Uh, yield farming is like just if you do a thing, um, you're sort of like on the distribution roles for like where the tokens will go. Uh, the most of the projects are choosing sort of block by block rewards. So if you do the thing for one block, you get a reward in the tokens pro rata for how much that thing you do. Um, and in that sense, it's sort of like this. It's kind of like a novel and new way to distribute tokens. Um, and I think a uh, wifey um, was the for the sort of had a, a new twist on that, whereas Compound was using it as liquidity mining to get people to participate, to make their lending markets more liquid. Um, 
which Ave will also be kicking theirs off soon. It might be happening retroactively. No one knows. Um, and uh, but but Wifey was the first one to just say we're going to use this as purely a token distribution model because we don't want to sell any tokens, and like we want to get everyone that like loves this stuff too to be part of the token distribution. Um, and if Compound sort of like was like the first like major shot that set everything off. Wifey was sort of like compound squared in that this idea that you could distribute all the tokens for a project in a week um, and the distribution you get, like compounds distribution was like very, amongst the portion of the tokens they distributed, it was very decentralized. Uh, Wifey's distribution, I think kind of like set a new standard in like getting a wide distribution. And, you know, we saw this string of like Proceedingly more sketchy wifey clones, um, many ended in tears. Um, also, just side note, clones are bad. Uh, <laughs> the first clone's like pretty bad, but the second, third, fourth clone really bad. Um, but uh, or so far that's been the case. And so we're seeing this new distribution, and we're sort of seeing emergent communities that really care. Um, maybe in a way that like some people might say hasn't really happened since uh, the initial Bitcoin launch. And like no one really, I don't think anyone has much certainty on what the path will be for sort of these emergent open corporations or emergent open organizations. Um, but at least the early results of like literally two or three weeks um, have been really like awesome and inspiring. And um, I think it's going to be like a, I don't know. I don't. I don't know for sure anything that will happen, but it might be like a new way to organize a group of humans to do something. And I think that's sort of like, haha, it's a meme about yams. Is like the joke that maybe makes people think it's fun and not be scared of it. Maybe they should be. Um, but at the same time, there might be something bigger if like these emergent open corporations can actually accomplish real things. And you don't have to like go out and recruit and hire people and like, like pay them salaries for literally anything you want to do. Like, are there some things that humans can just do together because they're all on the same team? And how do you get them on the same team? And so far, it looks like memes are a good way to do that. Well, it's it's kind of the whole point of all of this, right? We're sort of, you know, I, at least for me, it feels like the reason why I love these governance tokens and a lot of these things and some of the yield farming products in general are because it all kind of goes back to what banking and community style finance, community banking used to be about. It was called community banking because the community actually owned the bank. Like we got to work together. And that was the uh, at the very beginning of this, what got me super excited about yams, because at first it was like, OK, this is kind of silly. Ah, they combined two cool projects. They made a product and people are, are potentially making money here and whatever. And that was cool. But the fact that they rallied so many people and this is not as centralized. I was explaining this to a traditional like VC type of investor literally this week, yesterday. And the reason why that's exciting is because None of these companies, like Yam didn't have one person's email address. They didn't have, like there was no stickiness. Nobody did KYC. So I couldn't just go, hey, Joseph, shit's about to break, vote right now. Like all they could do is post on Twitter and post on Reddit and post on wherever we hang out, on um, Telegram chats and wherever. And they got thousands and thousands of people to delegate their, their tokens to this thing. And somebody, you know, somebody was comparing it um, uh, to like the national elections and how like, as Americans, nobody participates in voting, but here's an example of like just thousands of people instantly coming on board to, to do something uh, together. And that's that's insane. Like that's a huge, powerful, that's probably more powerful than how much, you know, how many, you know, the few billions of dollars that are staked in DeFi right now. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think in some senses, like it's it's so new that like extrapolating too far with any confidence is pretty foolish. But like, if you're thinking about what is like the high upside percentiles of like the distribution on how things would go, um, it, I'm like, I'm at least like entertaining the few percents possibility that like the scope of like this community bootstrapping or team of people working towards a common goal bootstrapping 
like could have a bigger scope of like its vision than e than even DeFi, which is itself fairly large, I'd say. Yeah, I mean it, I it's huge. Um, we 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 uh, Adam, you wanted to jump into more questions yeah. before we jump into networking. Yeah, one more. This one. I'll just go all day. Yeah. <laughs> This one comes from Chris, and I think maybe Jordan, you can even even tackle this one from a product perspective. Um, are there any user friendly wallets in the pipeline? Needing a PhD to figure out how to these various platforms is a huge barrier to entry. MetaMask is supposed to be user friendly. Sigh. <laughs> is it? I mean, I guess as opposed to attacking it. At are there user friendly wallets, right? What can wallets do to become more user friendly? What are the, like the major pain points that they're just missing out on, you think? Major pain points. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's, you gotta just start out with like, what's our goal here? I'm like, like MetaMask was really made for developers trying to launch decentralized products, right? And now they're, they're slowly starting to become more and more user friendly. Um, Personally, I think we have a ways to go to reach this mainstream adoption, like we're talking years. Um, everything we've talked about so far does need a PhD or at least a couple years in in, De in DeFi and Ethereum uh, in crypto. Um, I've been doing, I've been using MetaMask for what, three or four years now. And even today I had a transaction that was stuck and I couldn't get it unstuck and I couldn't speed it up and I couldn't cancel it. And I tried to send from my crypto to at the same nonce, try to send zero ETH and I, I, like I couldn't figure it out. I've been doing this for years and I couldn't get it to, it's still pending. Um, I uh, like, how am I going to explain this to anyone else? Um, it's, we've got a long way to go. I think that's okay because we're seeing a lot of people lose their shirt. Um, and it's only going to get worse in this, in this bull run that kind of feels like it's about to happen. I think it's really dangerous. Uh, I'm telling people to like stay away unless you absolutely know what you're doing. I'm having fun. My friends are having fun. We're going to, we're, we're throwing money and earning at yams. We're going to yieldfarming.info. And, um, but, a, but a newbie needs to kind of discover it for themselves. I think right now, um, there are certain apps and, and wallets out there that, that make it a little bit easier. I'll echo Scott's comment. I really love zapper.fi as well. Um, it kind of collects all the various, pools that you're in, essentially all the assets in your wallet, everything that you're, that you're doing to, to uh, deposit. But even that, like that's, that's nowhere near mainstream adoption, right? Um, even explaining what, what yield farming is or what, uh, why someone would want to borrow crypto is, is a tough conversation, even with some of the more technical people in my life. Um, I, so yeah, there are, there are things that are going well. I really like a lot of the latest, some of the latest products, um, Argent, um, Dharma, they're doing a lot of cool, interesting things around around wallets and not giving the user more than they need. Um, MetaMask is doing a lot of interesting things. I, I really do want to kind of pull back the curtain and show you some of the stuff that we're working on. I say we are participating here and there and giving comments here and there, but it, the team that's working on it, um, as kind of the, the MetaMask team is partnering with with the Codify team and we're kind of uh, attacking some of these problems together. Um, so big announcements in the coming weeks and months. So I'm excited to um, continue to push the envelope. I think the experimentation is great. It's funny because in normal startup life, right? Like um, you try to, you, you try to disrupt the, uh, the, try to disrupt the incumbents, right? And you want to experiment, you want to be agile and like, that's all. That's what we're. That's all you do in, in DeFi is just experiment and throw stuff. So I think in this world of experimentation, where someone can throw a smart contract in 30 minutes, like we did with the meme token, um, and have liquidity, have million dollar market cap get listed in snap of a finger, like we we need to do something to kind of rein in this um, the enthusiasm. I love it. Let's keep it on track. Let's prevent users from losing their shirt. Whether it's at the protocol level or the app level, user education is, is super important. Don't get into, don't don't FOMO into something that you don't know what's going on. I, I put a little bit of money into the YAM protocol until I figured it out what's, go, what's going on, until I talked to a couple of the founders. Uh, they seem, they seem uh, I mean, I, I, I've chatted with them in the past, so I knew what was going on. And then I put a little bit more, right? So don't throw up your whole stack into one 
uh, trending protocol. Yeah. But there's a lot of work we got to do. It's really exciting for the product builders and, and the early adopters. But I think we're going to be, you know, years from now, we're still going to be saying, how do we how do we have mainstream adoption in DeFi? It's yeah. just so a I, I wouldn't be doing that. To, to bash on MetaMask. MetaMask is uh, that was my first wallet, right? I think mm -hmm. it's, it's like one of the, it's the easiest one to use, in my opinion, right? So I think that was more tailored from okay, like how can we make it even simpler, right? How well, can we? I I've got yeah. to throw out there where what we're building with return, right? We wouldn't be doing our job. So the the fact that even the best wallets, you know, and I think we all probably use MetaMask ninety percent plus of our transacting, right? Um, uh, the even the best wallets are complicated to most people that that don't live in it like us. And so we're we're creating something called return. And the idea behind it is essentially to completely obfuscate crypto away from everyone. So you don't have your own keys. We don't talk about keys. It's all being uh, held by um, by a trusted bank. And so it's kind of like a, it's it's halfway crypto halfway in the in the real world. But the point of it is to kind of be a gateway, uh, a gateway drug or, or like a gateway to to the space. Right. I want people to go, oh, you know, and it's partnered with DMM, full disclosure, that's the first asset we're going to do. And people are going to deposit dollars, they're going to earn six and a quarter percent interest, and they're going to withdraw dollars. And they're never going to see the token, they're never going to see anything other than just understanding that, like, why is this possible? Oh, because of DeFi, because of, um, because of, uh, of, um, uh, most and the reason why it's different from other projects is that we're going to not have any of the crypto features, not allow anything other than depositing and withdrawing and making money. And the idea is is essentially that that you have you hold a token without holding the token. Somebody else does. And that's not crypto. We understand that it's not crypto. But I think that in the world where every transaction costs over a dollar or more, and that everybody needs to be technically savvy as a prerequisite to participating, that's not going to actually do what crypto wants to do either. We're not going to change the world by forcing everyone to know how to use computers when most of them don't have computers. We can't change the world when a transaction costs $5. So we're going to try to make something that's really simple that everyone can use that hopefully intrigues the crap out of everyone in the world and makes them want to participate in these DeFi products, because obviously that's where we want everyone to go towards. We want all of these products and we, I want everyone to use MetaMask and I want everyone to, to participate in the decentralized world and completely, completely, you know, disintermediate everything. But it's not going to happen um, yet with with the with what we have. And hopefully, you know, Casper fixes that for a lot of people and we can go yeah. direct that way. Um, but in the meantime, I think that's that's where it's going. So I had to throw that plug out there. Because we're working on something there, but, but um, you know, we're working I, on I'm, stuff I'm, too at the protocol level too. I mean, I believe that the protocol should provide certain core features that enable DApp developers to build amazing products, right? And so we support meta transactions. So the payment is no longer your customer's problem, right? As a DApp developer, you can specify how transactions are paid for. So if you want to uh, represent your application purely in fiat and the customer pays a subscription, you can pay for all of your customers' transactions and the transactions run in their context, right? So we provide that capability so you can abstract that away completely for the user, right? We're also gonna build in secure enclave support so you can actually use your iPhone as a biometric wallet. We're not gonna build the biometric wallet, but we're gonna definitely support the core, right? That, that protocol, the encryption, um, so that you know, DAP developers can build wallets and iPhone applications where you store your keys or your account data in in the secure enclave and you can also recover those accounts, right? So you can do on-chain account recovery in an easy way if you lose your phone or lose your keys or something like that happens. So at the protocol level, we're just here to enable, right, developers to build what they need to build on top of the protocol. So totally with you. Like that's where we see our place in terms of the user experience. Awesome. I, I want to hit us with a, a quick flash round of, of Q&A before we break off into the networking session and we call it a day. Um, I was hoping we can start with Jordan, go to Meta, and we'll end with Scott. I think Scott, what's his name? Uh, Stanny told me that his internet is having issues, so that's why he sporadically jumped off the screen. But one to two, th two things you're most excited about in the DeFi space and one to two things that concern you the most or that either concern you or that are not being talked about enough. 
the things that are exciting and the things that are not being talked about. Um, yeah, I hate to just keep bringing it up back around to risk, especially as I walk the balance between like this, uh, the work that I'm doing at Consensus and then the silly mean t token that I'm advising. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just really nervous about this next bull run, excited because we've been slogging through years uh, and building and building. So I'm excited to see kind of, um, you know, some, all the, all the effort we've been doing kind of show, show off and bear some fruit here. But I'm just worried that um, a lot of people are going to dump money just because it's gone, it went up yesterday or their friends, friend put, pushed money in. So I, I'm just worried for people and I, and I know it's going to happen and we all kind of know it's going to happen. But um, at the same time, I'm excited about certain projects that uh, put the user first, whether that's at the app level or protocol level. I really like Ave. We didn't get a chance to talk too much about what they're doing and the Avenomics are a uh, really interesting way to do it where comp and other things, comp has since, has since changed some things, but um, there, Ave is, is like, you're staking, but you're providing a backstop for the rest of the protocol. They're doing some really interesting things there. Uh, I've, I've probably talked way too long, but that's, uh, uh, that, yeah, that, those are some things that I'm really excited about. And anything that, oh, so you said risk is the one thing that concerns you. It's you both, it concerns me, you know, on one side and the other side, I'm excited about some of the innovation that's happening there because uh, it's a real problem that we, that we need to solve. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm also just excited to see where this yield farming stuff goes. I know it's a meme now. I know uh, there are some dangerous risks. I'm excited to see what the next YAM V2 is going to be. Um, excited where people people take this we're seeing we're seeing what DeFi is all about right the composability i don't mind that they grabbed this contract over here and jammed it into this contract over there uh I, personally i don't mind that we're you know as a as a user as an investor a, a person in DeFi, um i don't mind that we're testing in production this is cool i know the risks uh at the same time it's like trying to tell people do not push your money in unless you know what's going on. So I'm still, I'm trying to walk that line and it's difficult right now. Yeah. Well, thank you. Edda? Gosh, what's exciting to me is um, just, I'm excited for the future. I, you know, you see the possibilities, we can envision the future and I'm excited to see us continue walking down that path. Um, flip side, I love seeing the adoption, right? But the flip side, of course, sharing my thoughts with the uh, same thoughts as Jordan, I'm worried about the risk. I'm worried about um, the lack of, there's not enough transparency around for the average user, for the new user that this protocol has been tested. They can't look at the code. They can't make an informed decision easily as to whether or not they should, uh, you know, put their money in a given protocol. It's hard enough even investing in the stock market, right? Like that's hard enough. And people have, have not bothered to invest in individual stocks, right? But like when you start, going and looking at quote unquote investing in crypto or holding crypto assets, there's even another layer of complexity um, that they have to go through to try to understand what is it that I'm getting involved in here. And um, we have a lot of work to do. We have a long way to go. And I tend to agree that it's going to be years and years um, before, you know, before we see mass adoption and the whole government compliance thing. I mean, that is like a huge unknown, right? That we're still grappling with this space, but in, in general, I'm bullish and really excited about what the future holds. I think crypto is here to stay. I think it's all here to stay. No question about it. Cool. And Scott. Um, well, I kind of mentioned earlier, but definitely sort of this new, um, this, this new wave of open organizations um, and just seeing what they do is a, uh, Thing I'm most excited about. Um, I think one thing that I that that I think maybe you should get a little more attention is, uh, you know, in 2017 it was sort of like uh, par for the course uh, for people to kind of uh, shill before transfer tokens became transferable, um, or when there was low float right after a listing. Um, and I think now since then we have like a capital allocators uh, that have, uh, you know, amassed large thought leadership followings. Um, and I really don't think it's appropriate for, for them to like just 
lay out the thesis, um, you know, either right before the listing or right after it, before their vesting is started. Um, or if they are going to do that, they really need to like take a step up in how much vesting they're doing. Um, because what I don't want to see is I don't want to see these like towering thought leaders over the rest of the community kind of doing that, leading the thoughts and then also leading the dumps. Um, and I think that's not like a good situation for the community. And I really feel like we're past that, um, just as, as a group of humans. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Great. Communi the community kind of knows better, but that's where I think what Jordan was getting at is like, we can all feel like we know and understand, but then, you know, selfish people get selfish or just don't understand and do crazy things and follow guys like McAfee and a bunch of idiots like that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I haven't, yeah. I, I think I muted him a long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm not aware of what he's been talking about, but you know, I don't know if he's been talking lately either. To be honest, I just use him as an example of somebody yeah, I think, I think you never want to actually follow, but some yeah. people somehow believe in him. Yeah, I think he's supposed to get on TV or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Adam, before before we do end, I just want to say one quick thing because I actually um, on Twitter earlier today got a bunch of messages from people of somebody asking um, Joseph and my face were on the website of some random project as investors in the project. And we did, had never met these people. We don't know who these people are or whatever. So just at least on our end and with any investors, and I'm sure with other people on this panel and anyone else, if you see something that seems too good to be true, if something seems like a scam or not, and you can't verify like going to our website and seeing our name on it or doing something like that, reach out to the people, don't be shy because you know, we, we found out about something today and there's, there's all these scams going around and, and these people trying to take advantage. So as much as you can trust people, you know, who, who, you know, still do a little bit of your own research, please. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, um, please, uh, you know, share those scams when you see them and help the rest of the community out. Help, help retweet what I just posted in the chat. That's basically alone calling out the scammers. But uh, that's all the time we have today, guys. Jordan, Scott, Meta, guys, thank you so much. Stanny had to hop off last week. So if Stanny, you want, you're watching this, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, next up, we have the, the really fun networking session. There's still about so there's 138 of you online. We encourage everyone to stay and the speakers as well. If you guys can stay, if it's not too late on your end. Basically, I'm going to end presentation mode and we're all going to bridge off to these really colorful tables. And it's important for anyone that's new to blockchain and booze, have your cameras on, have your mics on, or else you're going to be very, very confused. All right. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, see you. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.